Welcome, I'm Nick Zeppos, I'm the Chancellor of Vanderbilt University, and welcome to the Zeppos Report, a podcast where I have the privilege of talking with some of the most interesting people who are shaping and helping us understand our world. My guest today is Jeff Rothschild. Jeff is a technology visionary. He's had a remarkable career before becoming the founding vice president of engineering for Facebook in 2005. There, he led the development of Facebook's infrastructure platform until 2015. We are very, very proud to say that Jeff is a Vanderbilt alumnus, uh, a double door, two degrees, bachelor's degree in psychology in 1977, and a master's degree in computer science in 1979. Jeff is also a member of our board of trust, and in July, we'll begin a term as a leader of the Board of Trust, as Vice Chairman. Jeff, it's great to have you here today on the Zeppos Report. Well, thank you, Nick. Very glad to be here. So you've had quite a journey um, out of Vanderbilt. And so when I see the youngsters on campus and, boy, I want to go to Silicon Valley. It's so exciting there. You were in many ways in the covered wagon, one of the first to leave Vanderbilt and find your way to what some people characterize as the most innovative place on the planet. What was your journey after Vanderbilt that took you to Silicon Valley, Jeff? Well, on leaving Vanderbilt, leaving uh, graduate school, I was convinced I wanted to be an entrepreneur. So I really had no interest in going to work for a company. Uh, If somebody had told me that, you know, you would have a career uh, rising up through the ranks of any prestigious company, I would have uh, found that a very depressing thought. I really thought entrepreneurial work was better suited for me. Uh, However, I had the small problem if I had no idea what I would build (laughs) or what I could do that people would find useful. So I figured I'd better take a job and and learn what's going on in the industry first. So uh, I looked around and uh, went through an interesting process of of, of interviewing companies. I I sort of viewed it as sort of the, the turning the tables a bit. I saw one firm uh, where I felt that they had a lot of need, and uh, that was Honeywell, which had a a very old uh, computer business. It was really a legacy business, and they were based in Phoenix, Arizona. And I said, they have more problems than any of the other companies (laughs) I've been talking to, so I'll go try that out. And I was there for a few months. The the person who I was working with at, uh, at Honeywell moved over to Intel, and he uh, convinced me to go over and help them out because they had a really big problem at Intel as well. That actually seemed more of a relevant problem. Moved to Intel, and from Intel, I went off to start start making uh, new companies and new, new products. Uh, California uh, entered into the equation because that is where most of the new uh, the new ventures are are founded. It, there's a lot of reasons for that. There's the uh, there's the capital infrastructure. So there's only probably 300 venture capital firms or large angels operating in the valley. And of course, there is a, a culture of people taking risk. It isn't hard to convince people to leave leave their jobs and and join your harebrained scheme of <laughs> you know of building whatever it is, is you know you think you can you you you, you can contribute. Well, you, you were very involved in. Uh the founding of Veritas Software and Empath Interactive. What was it like to go to Facebook? Obviously, hindsight's always twenty twenty, but what was it like to step in at a very early stage? I'll just tell you my memory is I remember coming out to see you one time, and as I recall, you had a floor on in a building on University Avenue. Yes, we did. And I remember, I think you all fit on that floor, and... I saw a lot of bright young people, and I remember you just showing me a lot of data and how this was allowing you to kind of reach so many people. And then, of course, I've visited you on the Facebook campus. What was it like when you first went there, and why did you go? Well, it you know, nothing happens really as planned. Uh, you had mentioned Empath and and Veritas, two companies that, you know, had IPOs. But there was probably another half dozen that you'll never hear the name of. <laughs> they're they're really craters in the ground, and uh, you can't 
expect to have those that were successful without having uh, a few that you've blown up as well, but you learn a lot from each one. So I had been doing entrepreneurship for years, and it's a wonderful journey, and it's tremendously exciting. Uh, at one point, uh, my wife asked, how about if you don't work 100 hours a week now and, <laughs> and, and, and do something a little bit quieter? <laughs> uh, and I said, you know, that's that's probably fair. Uh, how about if I spend some time just helping out others who are starting uh, companies, maybe some younger entrepreneurs who could use some mentoring? And I mentioned that to the venture firm that I work with, Excel Partners. And uh, after a few months, they uh, called me up and said, well, we've got a, this team out of Harvard, and they've got a social network. And I said, oh, God, a social network. <laughs> I, I saw a Friendster. And, and I said, no, no, they're, they're, it's different. Well, uh, I said, okay, I'll help them out for a couple of weeks, maybe help them recruit some members of their team. And so I just showed up, uh, got to meet uh, Mark and, and Dustin Moskovitz and, and the other early members of the team and really fell in love with the vision they had for Facebook. Uh, it, it, the Facebook we know today really was in Mark's head back in 2005. He, he could see what, it, what we're doing with the product at this point moment in time and how it's serving to connect people, uh, serve for it's, it's, it's a, it serves a role in, uh, in political conversations, in, in social discussion, and bringing families and friends uh, together. And that was just a really exciting vision. Uh, another element of, of, of those first few weeks and in, in, in getting to know the team that really impressed me was I looked at the mailbox, the letters that, that Facebook was getting from users. And people were writing us love letters. They hmm. were they were sending poems, and wow. I'd started companies before, uh, but yeah. nobody had ever sent me a poem. <laughs> uh, no one ever told me that it made them happier. So that was really exciting for me. Uh, at one, I couldn't sit around the office and not and not pitch in. I, I'm an engineer. I know initially Mark had hoped I'd help him recruit a VP of engineering, but. Uh, I started helping out with the engineering, and after a week or two, he just said, why don't you just do this yourself? And uh, that was music to my ears, so uh, I, dove, I dove straight in. Yeah, tell me about when you're, you're experienced and you're working with all these bright young people and they have a vision. Um, how much as a mentor and then as a business leader do you kind of strike the balance between we have to pay the bills but we can never lose that vision and the core culture of what we really are and preserving that idea of we got a love letter and I didn't get a lot of love letters when I started companies. How did you strike that balance? Well, that was really important to me, uh, especially uh, as Facebook started to grow. Uh, many people became suspicious of it and sort of assumed uh, you know, ill intentions for the company. But it's never been about the money. Uh, it's never – Facebook wasn't designed to be a company. It was designed as a service that was going to have impact on society. And I know that, you know, lots of companies say that they have missions that move beyond uh, business per se. But this is really true. Uh, there were – I can point to dozens of decisions that were made along the way that were – that didn't serve the interests of, uh, of the commercial interests of Facebook, but simply served the best interests of, of the users. And these were big decisions. Mm -hmm. the, uh, so that wasn't really a challenge here. The team, all, the, the, all of the people who joined Facebook in the early days cared about the mission of the company. Very few of them uh, thought, I'm joining a hot startup. Hmm. In fact, they didn't necessarily think it was a hot startup. They didn't yeah. think that this is the next best place uh, to earn money in an IPO because no one really saw what the uh, what the business model would be. But they were all those all people who cared about connectivity and social cohesion and uh, and 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 staying close and connected to their to their friends and and family and felt that was a valuable service to deliver. Yeah, what um, I think it's fascinating when you talk about failures and some craters. Um, and oftentimes, we forget that there were six or seven social media companies, or there were a lot of people trying to occupy that space. In your experience, Jeff, what really separates the one winner that comes out of the 
K-Pros and the Microsoft and the IBM. What, in your view, makes the winner? I think it's focusing on what the customer needs, what the user needs, and not focusing on what the company needs. The company, as you mentioned, needs revenue. But that doesn't mean you keep trying to make more revenue. Your focus simply has to be on uh, giving more value to the user. At Facebook, uh, we would really measure utility. Uh, you t that is, how much value you do, you get, do you get out of each click that you mm. give or each minute that you're on the site? And if we were able to fold information together so that you could accomplish the same task in half as much time, then we would do it. Mm -hmm. While most sites, of course, try to create additional interactions because it drives up the metrics mm -hmm. that people commonly use for measuring websites, our focus on Facebook was return on investment. And if you could get the same value in half the time, then uh, that time had, was twice as valuable to you. The ROI for the five minutes you put in where previously you'd spent 10 was twice as valuable to you, and it increased the likelihood that you would be coming back. Uh, we've had the privilege of having you come back and meet with our students and interact across the campus. Obviously, it's great to have you on our board of trust. I was struck that when you were here in the fall, you encouraged the students to learn inefficiently. What did you mean by that? Um, and why is that important in your mind? Well, at the risk of sounding like an old curmudgeon. That's okay. Uh, we You're used with to, another we, one. We used to do some things differently. Uh, when I was first uh, working with the computer system here at Vanderbilt, the Xerox Sigma 7 that occupied the round building in front of the old engineering school, the whole building was the Xerox Sigma 7. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, if I needed to learn something about that machine, about how it did some input or output or the side effects of a certain instruction, I needed to look through stacks of documentation. And mm -hmm. in looking for that piece of information that I needed, I inadvertently uh, would have to learn a lot of other things in order to get there because you couldn't just do a search and find that one line out of these eight large books that answered your question. And I've come to call that collateral knowledge, mm -hmm. knowledge that you didn't intend to gain, but it was a consequence of seeking something else. Well, while the collateral knowledge may seem inefficient when viewed in the context of that one search for information, uh, if you repeat that process a hundred or a mm -hmm. thousand times or 10,000 times, the amount of knowledge you've gained is immense and gives you a tremendous advantage over someone who happened to always open the book to the right page. Yeah. Well, with the technology we have today of searchable hypertext and online documentation, you can always open the book to the right page. And while, again, that's a tremendous efficiency when viewed in the narrow context of solving the problem that is in front of you at that moment, it, uh, it's, it robs you of the opportunity for that collateral knowledge. Yeah, I think it's interesting when you, uh, in the days when I was in school and would go to the libraries, we were all shelf grazers. And so you'd go to get a book, but then you'd see 20 books around there that you really thought, I should probably read that too. And I think there's a lot of wisdom to um, having a real broad view of what am I trying to learn and then, you know, kind of not inadvertently, but in a collateral way, learning a lot more as you're being focused. And I think it, it, it leads to, um, you know, I think in many ways a creative mind because you're saying, well, I'm looking straight at it, but there could be six things on other shelves or other booklets. So I, I think it's, it's really, really great advice. Uh, you majored in psychology. As an undergraduate, and then you did your master's in computer science, is there a logical progression from your study of psychology to comp sci? Today, if you were studying at Vanderbilt, I might say, oh, yeah, you're a neuroscience major, and you're really interested in neural networks, and you're going to study computer science. How did you think of those two together and adding them up 
Jeff, or were they disconnected? Oh, entirely. It was completely uh, just for a fortuitous path, not one that was planned, and really uh, ties into the theme of immersion Vanderbilt. I ended up in computer science because I had the opportunity as an undergraduate to work on research projects with the psychology faculty. Mm. The... Uh, I, as an undergraduate, what could I add to, a, to to this research project? Well, there's this pile of data. There's all <laughs> of these uh, scoring cards that somebody had written down by hand. We need to see if there's actually uh, something of value in that data. And I agreed to uh, do some data processing. So I took a, a course in Fortran, <laughs> learned to code, uh, started using some of the statistical and analytic tools that, that were available at the time. SPSS has been around forever. Sure. And uh, worked on a number of, uh, of uh, psych department projects uh, in my undergraduate career. Over a few years of doing that, I developed a true you know, st- passion for uh, the software and, and wanted to really understand how did the machine work. Mm-hmm. I was a user of the system, but I looked at that Xerox Sigma 7, and I said, well, the people who built this are like gods. They, they understand something that I could only dream about. I'd like to be, I'd like to be a god. I'd like, to, I'd like to understand how this machine works and be able to create one myself. Wow. It's somewhat godlike to create something that seems like it has life. Yeah. And it bothered me that, to me, it was all magic. And I, I felt that uh, it, would, it would be very satisfying to, for it to move from magic to, to, to understood knowledge. Yeah. Let me follow up on that. Uh, I think one of the amazing things that it's a lesson to particularly our young students and a lot of young entrepreneurs is that what you learned in college and graduate school is foundational, but you're not using that anymore in some strictly knowledge-based sense, maybe. How did you just come out of your education as, I'm going to be a lifelong learner because whatever the box you looked at, you were fascinated by, it's a very different box now, if it's even a box. What do you think carried you through so many changes and then working with all these youngsters at various points, particularly at Facebook? Well, I do think that it is key to be a lifelong learner. I, I still take courses online. I mean, I, I, I'm always trying to learn new things. That's what makes this interesting. The... Uh, And it's true that I can't point to any particular class from my psychology curriculum and say, I'm applying that in a specific situation. But in in its totality, uh, having uh, making a point of understanding the complete person, not just viewing someone as a developer or engineer, but as a human being who has a, a broad spectrum of needs, both professional and otherwise, uh, that allows you to tune a system. And a company and a team is a system as much as a computer is a system. So those, uh, the, the soft knowledge, let's say, as opposed to the, 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 the technology, is equally important in any form of, of uh, team-based effort. And of course, moving beyond a certain scale and trying to have greater impact in the world frequently and most most commonly causes forces you to uh, to deal with human systems as well as 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 machines I think it comes through as well in your description of Facebook being very user focused that we really cared about them rather than us and that's probably something that you did learn from from your 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 background in psychology um, Jeff let's talk uh, about, you know, kind of everyone is trying to predict, you know, flying cars and autonomous vehicles we're, we're seeing. Um, what really, in your view, are going to be the big breakthroughs? And then how do they positively affect the world that we live in? Well, of course, if I could accurately answer that question. There's a lot I could do with that knowledge. So, so, t- so this, take it for what it's, uh, what it's worth, and it's, all, it's wor- isn't worth anything. Yeah. But my, uh, if I had to look at 
you know, make a forecast over the next 10 or 15 years uh, in terms of what technology, how technology will affect society. I think that we'll define the next decade as a de decade of augmented intelligence and where uh, machines and, and the technologies of machine learning will improve the efficacy with which people can perform their work or pursue their passions. It doesn't have to be you know, a commercial endeavor. Just as the personal computer improved productivity for 15 years, you know, in 85 to 2000, that was a major uh, contributor to improving uh, you know, performance of the overall economy because it removed inefficiencies from, from, from the economy. Looking for in last the last ten years, data analytics have entered into almost every uh, every field of human endeavor. I just have to make the, take the next step and say, well, moving beyond analytics, it's only a small step to machine learning, mm. artificial intelligence. I don't view it as people drop out of the equation. If we you know we often talk about self-driving cars. I don't think we're going to let uh, big rigs driving down through our neighborhoods uh, mm -hmm. their thing on their own without anyone in the vehicle. But I do believe the operator of that truck is going to be safer uh, and society will be better because they are uh, they're assisted in their driving by uh, a artificial intelligence systems, systems which are able to use uh, machine vision and the knowledge of how road accidents happen to keep those drivers uh, safe. I look at the self-driving car and I say, well, it, it's going through a neighborhood and there's a, um, there's a child on the side of the road. Well, that child is, might be walking to school, but they might be throwing a ball. Mm -hmm. Well, can the, can, the, can the AI in that vehicle understand that that game of catch often results in a ball going into the roadway? Or there's a person on the side of the road uh, it, but they're acting erratically. They may not seem well, or they they they, they may be unstable. Uh, can can the machine judge that? And I'm not sure that we're. I, I know we're not at that level today, and but I do believe that these self-driving technologies will be in most every car going forward. But I still think we'll be in the driver's seat. Because there's a certain number of judgment calls that I believe the human, at least for the first, for as, for as far as I can see into the future, I think will have to be part of. Yeah, I think the way you talk about it as augmented intelligence is is very very um, interesting, and I think is a little bit um, the partnership between technology and what makes the human still unusual and important. I think is a very very interesting way to think about it. And, um, you know, when I think about augmented intelligence, augmented health, we really are keeping this as, you would say, human-centric in some way. Yes. With support from, from um, the technological breakthroughs and then the machine learning that you talk about. Right. Um, let, let me change gears here a little bit. Um, this winter, you and your wife, Marika, made a spectacular a uh, $20 million gift through a donor advised fund to Vanderbilt to support our residential colleges program, um, our college halls program. And um, you've lived in many of these dorms, and you, 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 you obviously can see what the towers look like in that. But tell me, what really uh, drew you and Marika to support this project today? And, you know, how does it fit into your vision of Vanderbilt and your own experience at Vanderbilt, Jeff? Well, I always planned, as much as you could plan anything, that uh, at some point I, I would try to give back to Vanderbilt. When I was in graduate school, I, I was supported as a graduate student. I had a scholarship. Uh, the fact that the school was willing to take me with my awful grades and, <laughs> and a background only in psychology, to me, I, was, I viewed that as a blessing. And I always felt that was a debt that I was going to have to, should, should be repaying. So uh, it wasn't really a stretch for me to, uh, to you know, decide to participate in, in a way that would be appropriate. And I'm fortunate enough to be in a position where I could do something as you know, that's, that's meaningful at that level. But it, even if I hadn't been at a lower, as, at, a, at a relatively smaller level, I also would have been yeah. uh, uh, giving back to the school. I felt that I, I benefited greatly from 
uh, from my experience at Vanderbilt. I mean, as I mentioned earlier, I wouldn't have ended up in this field, one that I never yeah. embarked to, 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 to participate in, if it hadn't been for the opportunity of being at a research university that actively engaged the undergraduate population in undergraduates in, in uh, faculty research. If, it, if I had simply attended classes, I don't know where I would be today, but I doubt that I would have uh, you know, followed this trajectory. Well, it's, it's uh, extraordinary generosity. And you know, when did you and Marika kind of, you've been very, very successful, but you are also what I would insist would be true philanthropists. And how did, how did you kind of go through that process of giving back and thinking about that? What was the evolution um, that led you to be so generous, not just to Vanderbilt, but, you know, in your own neighborhood, Jeff, and around the globe? How do you come to your philanthropy? I don't think we ever do it alone. The, uh, we live in a society that has laws, that those laws make it possible for us to sign contracts and build businesses and with the knowledge that it's not going to be taken from you. Uh, people are willing to take risks to work with you and their company. Their training came from uh, institutions like Vanderbilt that, mm -hmm. uh, that, that gave them the skills to be able to help you achieve your your goals. We do, we're not in this as individuals. Uh, and then there's the element of luck. Let's, you know, mm. I, I know that many successful people <laughs> attribute their success entirely to themselves. Uh, rarely is that true. Uh, th 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 luck also plays a role. Uh, so there's a lot of things that contribute to, to, to success. And if you're in an opportunity to be able to uh, help others improve their lives, uh, to leave the world a, hopefully a better place than you found it, I, it would seem I wouldn't understand someone not wanting to, to do that. Yeah. And, if I, now, and I'm lucky enough to be in a situation where you know, we are able to help out in, 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 a, in a variety of ways and hopefully we'll have some impact. Well, I can tell you it's already having an impact here. Um, Jeff, being on the Board of Trust, you come to meetings, but I think we try to involve you in so many other things. One thing that you've been involved in is what we call Future VU, which is looking at a Vanderbilt that is very different from the one you went to, and then, frankly, looking at a Nashville that is very different from one 10 years ago. Um, what do you find of greatest interest in thinking about our land, our city, the use of technology and design on and off our campus? What, what, what really has struck you about the project that you've been involved in? I think it's a uh, recognition that uh, in addition to having physical structures in which learning can take place or research can be done, that an important part of the experience on campus is being close to nature, uh, having quiet, uh, quiet areas, areas that, ha that have, have grass, have trees. Uh, th th all of this contributes to an individual's psychic well-being. And the emphasis in the plan of creating uh, pathways and, and trajectories across the campus uh, that are pleasant to, to traverse uh, and, and that are an improvement over the ones that you know that that I traveled as a as a student at Vanderbilt. That's very exciting, and I think that uh, while you know we like to to think of the university as this collection of research labs and 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 dorms and classrooms, it's the space between them that I think uh, most of us remember and uh, allows us to be effective as as students and uh, at the university. Very very well said, um, Jeff. Let me thank you so much for being here today and for your outstanding leadership and service to Vanderbilt and the extraordinary generosity uh, from you and Marika. And um, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Um, you can download this and other episodes of the Zeppos Report at uh, Jeff, forgive me, I'm doing it the old fashioned way, vu.edu zeppos-report. 
vu.edu zeppos dash report. Jeff, thanks so much for being here today. Thank you, Nick. It was a pleasure. Thank you.